brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a great joy to be with you tonight to spend some time and adore our blessed Lord together. You know, what a tremendous blessing it is to be a priest, to be your priest here on the Barrier Island. And what a joy and honor it is to be able to bring Jesus to you and to your families. When Father Brian asked me to preside and preach um, at tonight's holy hour, uh, I asked him, uh, you know, what the theme was of, of the preaching. And he said, you know, whatever you want. And yeah, I found that to be, to be very difficult um, find it easier when someone assigns me something and then that's, that's what I preach about. Uh, but this, I, I, I was, uh, there's so many things that, that I could talk about this evening. Um, and I still, even uh, to today, hadn't uh, narrowed it down. I had a couple of things on my heart and my mind, but I was having, a, having lunch today with a priest friend and he said, yeah, do the people know you since you've been here, the short time I've been here? And I said, no, not really. I said, oh, then why don't you share your vocation story? Ha has anybody here heard my vocation story? All right. Oh, one person. Great. <laughs> All, right. All right. So let me get along. Um, you know, if you have... Uh, listen to some of my homilies on Sundays, you might have asked yourself, oh, how did this uh, unworthy person become a priest? And if you were to ask any number of my friends who knew me from yeah, high school and college, you know, they, even to this day, they can't believe that I turned out to be a priest. So here's... Um, one version of yeah, my story. I was born and raised Catholic, uh, Seoul, South Korea. And on November 17th, 1982, um, something happened, something amazing happened. And this is what I consider to be the most important day of my life. What do you think that day is? Any, anyone wanna venture a guess? What day is that? Thank you. Uh, did you hear, did anyone hear what uh, Doc said? Yeah, it was the day that I was baptized, November 17th. And that's also the day um, I received new life, obviously, in Christ, but also my name, Leo, in, in the Korean church um, the the congregation the community we would refer to each other as brother and sister followed by our the name we receive at our baptism so November 17th in the old church calendar that was uh, the feast day of Saint Leo the Great so um, it's a beautiful tradition um, and I consider it yeah, more important than the day that I was born um, the day that I was ordained a priest, uh, June 23rd, two years ago. And can I make, make a uh, recommendation? Um, if, you, if you don't know the day that you were baptized, uh, go back to your records and find, that, find out that date. And mark it on your calendar and celebrate it, intentionally celebrate it with your family and friends. Do something, do something special, right? Because truly, that's the day that we were all given new life when we were born again into Christ's death and resurrection. So fast forward a bit to when I was four years old. Uh, this is the, the cathedral in Seoul, uh, the parish where my parents were worshiping 
also the parish where they were married. And during Sunday Mass, uh, you know, just like any other four-year-old, there was no cry room. So I was, you know, messing around and goofing around. And I fell while I was playing around. And my parents told me that I hit my head on, on the pew, on the seat, on the wooden pew. And uh, yeah, it was a loud, loud dud. And I started crying uncontrollably just wailing and it was it was during the mass and then the priest stops his homily and he starts um, talking to my parents said he said to them something to the effect of uh, because he's told me this story a number of times Hey, could you not even, you know, control your own child in this beautiful cathedral with this beautiful um, liturgy and the choir? Um, can you not tend to your own child that he has to disrupt this mass? Uh, he was yelling at them. And he said, you know, it would have been better if you would have never had that child at all. Now, you think I'm joking, but yeah, his words were very severe and harsh. So obviously my parents, um, embarrassed, uh, had to take me and, and, just, and just leave uh, in the middle of Mass. I picture it like a scene from um, yeah, Genesis, Genesis 1, Adam and, Lee, Adam and Eve fleeing the Garden of Eden. Actually, is that chapter one? Might be chapter two. <laughs> it's amazing the faith that my parents had and the faith that they passed on to me. Because even after such a horrible experience of the church, they never stopped practicing their faith. Thank God for them. Fast forward a couple years, a number of years. Um, to my confirmation I'm 16 years old uh, my parents are both faithfully uh, practicing Catholics you know they're dragging my, myself and my younger sister to Mass every Sunday actually like 30-40 minutes even before Mass begins because my dad uh, is a member of the choir still is and so um, yeah I think like most young people today um uh, wasn't too religious or spiritual. I just did it because yeah, that's what we did as a family. And, and what I look forward to was getting together with my friends. And, and at that age of 16, um, you know, connecting with, with girls that I, that I liked, that I was attracted to. Um, it was time for confirmation. I don't remember anything of the preparation but my parents uh, said, hey, this is, this is important, so you, know, you need to be confirmed. And they said, if you, if you uh, go, go ahead with confirmation, um, we're, we're going to give you a confirmation gift, anything that you want. And so at that time, uh, I wanted like a new shiny watch from the department store. So I told them that's what I wanted, and that was my main motivation to receive confirmation. Um, so now you must be thinking, you know, how did this punk kid become a priest and standing before you, uh, preaching to you? Um, well, this is where my journey of faith really, I feel like, uh, began, right? Where when I started to get to know and encounter, love, and follow Jesus. After I graduated from college, during which time I did not practice the faith when I was away from home, when I was away at college, except for maybe you know Easter and, and Christmas, I came back and I saw all my, all my old friends from the parish and the director of religious education he was in a real bind. So 
when I had returned home, I, I started doing what I had known my whole life. You know, go to church on Sundays with my family. And uh, the DRE, he was so desperate because one of his catechists for the sixth and seventh grade, he, he, he took a job as a, as a cook, as a chef on the weekends, so he couldn't teach on Sundays anymore. So he, he saw me uh, and he said, Leo, would you, would you please take over this class, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, what, what the heck do I know about religion? To be, um, to be worthy as, as a teacher, as a catechist, to teach these young people. He begged and he begged, and yeah, out of pity, um, I, I agreed, and I agreed. But before, but before I got into class, I knew that, um, because I, at least I had a sense of discipline and responsibility, um, instilled upon me from my parents and my teachers. All right, if I'm going to teach something, let me take this opportunity because I don't want to look like a fool. Uh, I, so I guess it was a selfish interest. Let me study the faith so that I can pass on something. And that's when my, like I said, faith journey really uh, jump-started because the more and more I learned about the Catholic faith, and more importantly about God, who the person of Jesus was that laid the foundation for me to fall in love. Right? And, and throughout those years, the more I learned, the more I loved the person of Christ. Because if you think about it, can you really love somebody that you don't know? especially you don't know much about or anything about? No, right? Yeah. The heart it cannot love what the mind doesn't know. And so the natural progression after falling more and more in love with Christ is to follow Him. If someone who you loved asked you to do something yeah it's really hard to say no to them especially when you know and love and trust them and you know that ultimately it's for your own good but that time I wasn't I wasn't ready to to give my fiat my yes to God uh, not a hundred percent you know do some things for the parish Sure, catechist, young adult group, um, okay. But uh, to be a priest, which you know, some people at the parish had encouraged me to do and think and consider, no way, right? Because I wanted to be happy like anyone else. And you know, as a priest, you wouldn't be able to get married and have a family of your own. Because you know, my own plan was to become wealthy, to, to live in a big house, beautiful wife, kids, you know, have uh, the nicest toys, uh, a fast, expensive car. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really, I wasn't ready to sacrifice and let those things go in order to say yes to God. Um, but it got to a point where Christ was the center of my life. I had fallen so much in love. Whatever he would ask of me, I would say yes. And so I had been putting it off for so long. And by the time I was 29, I was ready to say yes. But before that, I had to know, Lord, is this really what you're asking of me to become a priest? And the moment I decided to seriously think about it and pray about it, and especially spend quiet time, quality time with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Just become clearer and clearer. And, you know, there wasn't this kind of panic or fear or worry. Oh, how could I leave everything behind to follow you, Lord? It was just a sense, a wave of peace um, that came over me. Um, 
Yeah, and then once I said yes to God, seminary, six years later, priest, you know, and the rest is, rest is history. So thanks for listening. Will you allow me to close with uh, one final thought of the night? Actually, I don't know. I don't know why I ask because now I'm going to share it <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but I guess if someone really objected, I would you know, consider it. Um, question for you. How can we as faithful m- disciples bear fruit in our ministries? As we heard in our gospel, our Lord wants us to bear fruit right, in our discipleship. How can we do that? Because one of the key aspects of discipleships following Christ is to learn about Him, right? Just like how my journey really began, uh, to learn about Him. And, you know, that really comes from the word disciple itself. In Greek, the word disciple means to learn. Fundamentally, a disciple is one who learns, so the more you learn about Christ, the more you can love Him, the more you can follow Him. But another key trait to an authentic disciple is joy. It's to be joyful. Have you heard of a thing called RUF? Yeah, an acronym RUF. It stands for Resting Unfriendly Face or Resting Unapproachable Face. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Yeah. Then please let your face show it. You know, and I'm preaching to myself because oftentimes I could get so caught up in in my own little world with my own little problems that I can forget to witness to the joy of the gospel, the joy of knowing and loving Christ, the joy of being a disciple of Christ, Jesus who is truly present in the Eucharist. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let's take this blessed opportunity to bask in the warmth of His love and mercy so that we can be transformed and go bear fruit as the Lord's missionary disciples. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.